What is the number one skill you need to express yourself completely in English? It's vocabulary. If you don't know the words, well, then you can't say them. But I have some good news. Today, you are going to expand your vocabulary so that you can express yourself completely. Hi, I'm Vanessa from SpeakEnglishWithVanessa.com. Today, you are going to learn vocabulary words through pictures. I've prepared over 60 images from around the internet with 10 different topics to help you never forget these wonderful vocabulary words. And also to help you never forget, I have created a free PDF worksheet just for you with all of today's vocabulary words and ideas and concepts that you are going to learn in this important lesson. You can click the link in the description to download the free PDF worksheet today. All right, let's get started with our first category and our first set of pictures. Our first category is professions. These people are receptionists. They work in customer service, or you can say they work in hospitality. They might say, I work the front desk at the Hilton Hotel. I work the front desk at whatever the company is. This guy is called a digital nomad. This means he can work from anywhere. He might also be a freelancer or an independent contractor. So he can work beside the pool in his sunglasses if he wants. This person is a small business owner. She runs a boutique. It looks like it sells clothes, maybe some other uh, beauty products, and she's a small business owner. Other small business owners might say, I work for a startup or I'm running a startup. This means it's a new company, usually a tech company. Or a small business owner might say, I'm an entrepreneur. Or a fun word, I'm a solopreneur. This has to do with a company that's generally run by just one person. This person is an artist. There are many different types of artists. You could be a sculptor like this person, or a designer, a painter, or a musician. I'm sure there are many other types of artists. This person is a teacher. She teaches in a classroom, but there are other types of teachers as well. You might say, I'm a coach, I'm a professor, I'm a mentor, or I'm a guide. This guy works in construction. He operates heavy machinery. Heavy machinery might be the cement truck that's in this picture. It could be a forklift, but it has to do with the type of work that he does. Other types of people who work in construction are electricians, architects, and plumbers. All right, let's go to our next category, which is clothing. The type of clothing that this person is wearing, we might say they are looking quite relaxed. They are wearing athleisure. <laughs> this is a mix of two words, athletics and leisure. In the US, it's really common and quite popular to wear athleisure. Even when you're not going to the gym, this might just be the clothing that you wear. Other words that we can use to talk about relaxed clothing are slouchy, sloppy, grungy, disheveled. These are all pretty negative words, but it's true that sometimes when you're just hanging out at home, you might wear some clothes that are sloppy. You don't look too great, but it doesn't matter. This person has a casual look. She's wearing jeans and a sweater. We call this everyday wear. Now this depends on where you live, what is considered casual wear. In the US, it's jeans and a t-shirt, but maybe your country generally has more formal clothes in daily life, so it might be a nice sweater and some jeans that fit. It looks like she's even brushed her hair, but this is a casual look. Here we have business casual. This is a common expression that you'll hear in the workplace. The dress code is business casual. You can see that these people don't look overly formal. The man is wearing jeans and a colored button-up shirt, 
And the woman here also has pants. She has a, a somewhat business-like top, but it's not too formal. Sometimes we call these slacks if they're black pants or something that's not too casual, slacks. Uh, we also might say a blazer. A blazer is a casual suit jacket. <laughs> um, or we could say they're just well-dressed. Next, we have business formal. These people definitely look more formally dressed and they have a uh, a nice black coat on. <laughs> um, some terms that we use in these situations are they are dressed to impress. <laughs> this means that they want to look nice because they want to impress their clients, their boss. Um, maybe they're trying to get a new job, whatever it is, they are dressed to impress. Um, we also sometimes use the term dress for the job you want. This means maybe you don't have the highest position in the company, but if you dress smartly like this, well, maybe you'll get a promotion. So you're kind of putting yourself there in that mental space. I'm going to dress for the job that I want, not for the job that I have. <laughs> um, some other fun expressions we use for these types of clothing are a power suit. This is especially used for women <laughs> when you have a, a nice suit shirt jacket, <laughs> a nice colored shirt, and maybe you are wearing um, suit pants. This could be a power suit or a pants suit where you have pants and a jacket that match. And here as well, all of these, almost all of these people are wearing a button down. We could say a button down shirt, but sometimes we say, oh, my button down is wrinkly. I need to iron it. Just button down. Um, all right, the next people <laughs> are wearing uniforms. A lot of people wear uniforms. Uh, school children wear uniforms. People who work in the hospital wear a uniform. It's called scrubs. People who work in the military wear a uniform. And a lot of other professions wear uniforms as well. And finally, in our clothing category, we have formal attire. <laughs> um, so here, usually when you go to a wedding, you wear formal attire. The men are wearing suit coats and ties or bow ties. And if everyone had a black suit, we would call this a black tie affair. <laughs> this is as formal as it gets. Here they're wearing gray suits. This was probably something that the groom suggested for the men to wear. But we sometimes say a black tie affair. This might be like the Met Gala. A lot of celebrities are wearing black suits. This is a black tie affair. Um, another fun idiom we use to talk about formal dress is they are dressed to the nines. This is the number nine. <laughs> and it simply means they are really dressed up. They are dressed formally. Um, sometimes people dress up just for fun. And we might say, I'm all dressed up with nowhere to go. Okay, maybe you were just having fun and you were dressing up <laughs> uh, at home. You could say, I'm all dressed up with nowhere to go. Does anyone want to go somewhere? <laughs> and this is an expression you'll probably hear in movies or TV shows. All right, let's go to our next category, which is hobbies or ways that we can describe ourselves based on our activities. Your hobby might be that you like to create. There are lots of different things that you can create. This guy looks like he's creating some kind of media possibly a video, maybe he is a content creator. That's what we call people like me <laughs> who make videos for YouTube or maybe they take pictures for Instagram. They are a content creator. But other things you could create is you might knit, you might paint, you might write, you might do crafts. There's a lot of things that you can create. This person likes to tinker. The expression to tinker usually means that you're not a professional, you're an amateur, but you still love to make something better. Usually this has to do with being a mechanic. Here she's working on a motorcycle, restoring something, fixing something. You're not creating something 
where there was nothing before. Instead, there's something that exists and you're trying to make it better. So she is tinkering. Or maybe you are adventurous. <laughs> maybe you like to go on road trips or you like to jet set around the world. You like to go backpacking, try new foods, have exciting experiences, or climb giant rocks like this guy. <laughs> It's possible you are an animal lover. It's possible that she just has a dog and she loves her dog. <laughs> but maybe you work with animals. You could be an animal trainer. Maybe you have a hobby farm. This means that it's not your career to have chickens and cows and goats, but it's just for fun. It's a hobby farm. Or maybe it's more serious and you are a rancher. You have a lot of cows, a lot of space. <laughs> you might be a rancher. Or you might try to rescue animals. So you might work at an animal rescue center. Or you can foster animals. This is what my family did last month. We fostered two little lab puppies and this means that we temporarily had them for three weeks until someone adopted them. We gave them a good home for a few weeks until they could find a home forever and it's better than them staying at the shelter. Maybe you're an animal lover. <laughs> This person is a foodie. This is a very modern word, but you will hear this all the time. A foodie loves to try new foods. They like to cook and eat food, and maybe they even like to take pictures of their food and share it, but foodies are people who love every aspect of food and are adventurous eaters. This person Yes, she loves to read, but sometimes we call people who really love reading a nerd. It doesn't have to be a negative term. Some people might feel it's a little negative, but for me, I embrace it. I am a nerd. <laughs> I love to read. There are different types of nerds. Some people might be more of a nerd when it comes to science fiction. Maybe they really love comic books. Um, there's some people who really are obsessed with certain games like Dungeons and Dragons is a very popular game. In this game, you create stories and you interact with other people. So someone might say, I am a nerd for Dungeons and Dragons. This person loves sports. So here we have some volleyball players. They are playing volleyball, but you don't have to play a sport to be into sports. You might just be a fan like this guy. Maybe this guy's athletic, maybe he's fit, I don't know, <laughs> but really he is into sports. So you could be a sports player or a sports fan. All right, let's go to the next category, which is celebrities and their looks. I guess I should say not all of these people are celebrities. I don't think she's a celebrity, <laughs> but the term we can use to talk about her is a lovely one, the girl next door. She probably doesn't live next door to you, but this term has to do with someone who is wholesome. Yes, they are pretty or cute, but they're wholesome. They're not, you know, a secret spy in the night. No, they're just a wholesome person, unassuming, charming, and you just love them because they're not extremely special, but they're wonderful. On the other hand, <laughs> a wonderful term we can use to talk about a different type of woman is a bombshell. So here, this is a movie called Bombshell and it's featuring three blonde women. Now, sometimes we use the term bombshell to talk about someone who is stunningly beautiful. All three of these women are stunningly beautiful, but it's also a play on words because in this movie, these, uh, these journalists, bring to light a shocking scandal. So it's kind of like these bombshell, beautiful women are also like a bomb because they reveal something shocking in this movie. But you might hear this term used, bombshell, to refer to a beautiful woman. Um, here we have a lovely term, someone is curvy. So instead of saying she's not thin, a really positive term that we can use is she's curvy. Yes, not everyone is stick thin. This is not, 
and ideal for a lot of people. Maybe that's your body naturally, but maybe it's not. So I think nowadays, some celebrities who are curvy, we call this having an hourglass shape, are trying to embrace that. You can also say she is full figured. This means she's not a stick. Instead, she has an hourglass shape. She's full figured. She's curvy. And we could say Obama is charismatic. Someone who's charismatic is charming. Usually they're also good looking. They're a smooth talker and they're confident. Someone who is charismatic. I think it's a it's a wonderful goal to try to be charismatic in English. Express yourself well. Use all of these words. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe, we could say she is iconic. We use this expression only for people who are extremely well known, especially for something specific. So we could say Marilyn Monroe is an iconic figure. She is best known for her hourglass figure and her good looks. She was also a very smart businesswoman and a very intelligent person, but she's best known for her looks. We talked about a lot of expressions you can use for women, but for men, you can use the term chiseled. I wanted to give you the original meaning of that first. Here you can see a statue, and it's kind of funny because the statue is chiseling himself. <laughs> he is making something out of a piece of metal or a piece of stone. And what that means when we talk about someone is usually their face. When we say someone is chiseled, that usually has to do with their jawline. So we could say he has a chiseled jaw. And that's generally considered something positive in Hollywood. Someone has a chiseled jaw. And this is just a genetic feature. All right, let's go to our next section where you'll be introduced to some heroes or inspiring figures and some words we can use to describe them. Do you know who this is? This is Marie Curie. She is a famous scientist. She was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize, the first and only woman to win two no Nobel Prizes and in two different domains. She has completely changed science. So we could say she is intelligent. She was extremely focused and she is a trailblazer. This is a wonderful term for someone who was the first in something. Other people who followed in her footsteps had a little bit of an easier time because she blazed the trail first. She was the trailblazer and then other people could follow. This is Mother Teresa. She set up soup kitchens. She helped lepers. She helped the dying destitute. She really had a heart for people who couldn't give back to society. It didn't matter that she couldn't receive anything. She wanted to give to them. So we could say she is compassionate. She is nurturing. She is kind. She has a kind heart. Next, we have the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama is the most famous Buddhist teacher in the world, and he's widely respected for his commitment to nonviolence and the cause of Tibetan freedom. So we could say he is wise, he is patient, and he is peaceful. Probably three things that we could all do with a little bit more. This is Nelson Mandela. He is a South African anti-apartheid activist, the most well-known, and he was the first black head of state in South Africa. So we could say he was powerful. He was a visionary. He was courageous. Lovely expressions. And on the other side of the world, this was Abraham Lincoln. He was a president in the U.S. during the American Civil War. So it was a really difficult time in the U.S. for a lot of people, and he pushed to preserve the Union. This is what we call all of the United States. He wanted to preserve the United States and abolish slavery. Some terms often associated with him are empathy. He cared about those who were enslaved. Integrity and honesty. Sometimes we even use the expression honest Abe. He's such an honest Abe. Oh, my son's such an honest Abe. He can't lie. Anytime he lies, it's so obvious he's an honest Abe. 
And finally, we have a mythical, or we should say fictional person, but they were also real. <laughs> this is Rosie the Riveter. And during World War II, you would have seen these posters all over the US. And it was because a lot of men, almost all of the young men were fighting in the war. So who could do the men's jobs back in the US? Well, it was the women. So this was supposed to mobilize women to go to factories, to work towards creating and preserving what was left of the country while the men were gone, and it was supposed to empower women. In fact, my great-grandmother was one of these women. She left her, her family and she went to go work in the factories while all of the men were gone during World War II. So we could say that Rosie the Riveter embodies the idea of someone who is strong, someone who's bold, someone who is resilient. I love that word. All right, let's go to our next category, which is about money. Oh my, does this picture hurt your heart? Burning money. <laughs> well, there are two idioms that I'd like you to remember about this picture, and it is to have money to burn. You could say he got his first paycheck and now he has money to burn. This means he really wants to spend all his money. Or you have money burning a hole in your pocket. You just got paid and you're just feeling like, oh, I need to spend that money. I need to do something with it. You're not gonna save it. You're not gonna give it away. Instead, you just can't stop thinking about it. That money is burning a hole in your pocket. With this picture, I want you to learn the expression, all he sees are dollar signs. <laughs> this is someone who cannot stop thinking about money. All he sees are dollar signs. How much was that? Oh, could I buy that? Hmm, I wonder how much that was. If I saved, all they can think about is money. <laughs> In this picture, you could say, this person has a lot of money. They are a hot shot. They're a high roller. They're a big spender. Most normal people don't go around carrying this much money, but a hotshot might do that. <laughs> On the other hand, ugh, if you have nothing in your pockets, this type of image exactly means you are broke. This doesn't mean that you broke a bone. It means you have no money in your wallet. You have empty pockets. Sometimes if someone wants to say that they don't have any money, all that they might do is this. They might touch their pockets, maybe pretend to pull them out, say, sorry, I don't have any money. It's kind of a classic symbol of I have no money. <laughs> Somebody who is a penny pincher, hmm, do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it all depends on how you say it. If you say someone is a penny pincher, usually it's not so positive. It means that they're always trying to look for a shortcut, ways to save money, but sometimes that means that they are not very generous and they're just trying to save money. Um, somebody like this can also be called cheap. You don't wanna be called cheap. <laughs> not positive. Or even worse than that is a tightwad. Oh, he's such a tightwad. Last year he gave me a pencil for Christmas. <laughs> but if you are careful with your money, you're not a tightwad, you're not cheap, you're not a penny pincher, but you don't spend money all over the place, you can use a positive term. You are frugal. This is the term that I like to think about for myself. I try to be generous to other people, but I also try to be frugal. I'm careful with my money. All right, let's go to the next category, which is the space around us. Oh my, this room is cluttered. It's messy. It's a pigsty. <laughs> this refers to the place where pigs live. Pigs are not known for being neat and tidy. So I'm sorry if someone came into your house and said, oh my, it's a pigsty in here. It's not a compliment. On the other hand, this person is neat, tidy, organized, and a lovely advanced word is meticulous. You can be meticulous about your space. It's very organized. It's not that this person has nothing in their house. They have things here, but it's all organized. 
but you can also be meticulous in your work. This is a great word to use for a job interview when you're describing your work ethic. If you're detail oriented, you never forget the little details. You could say, I am meticulous. You will never have to ask me twice and I will always try to do it exactly right the first time. You are meticulous. Now, this picture, yes, there's a lot of things, but the feel of this place is homey. Now, when a place is homey, it means it's cozy, it's intimate, it feels like somebody lives here. It's well decorated, but it just feels like home. On the other hand, this place is sparse, minimalistic, cold, and sterile. Sometimes this type of decor, it's not really even decor, but this type of architecture is popular online because I think people see pictures of this and they think, oh, it's so simple. You don't have to clean anything. But would you want to live in a place like this? No, I'd much rather live in a place like this. <laughs> the final expression and picture we're going to use to talk about space is open, spacious. It is even sprawling. Sprawling has to do with a big space. And we might even say that this room, here's the kitchen, you can see the living room in the distance, it flows. So the house flows from one room to the next. You don't have to open a door, close a door, go down a hallway. It just easily flows from one room to the next. It's very airy. All right, let's go to the next category, which is holidays. Holidays are usually family oriented. You might spend time with your family because you have deep family values. And if you enjoy spending time with your family, you might say we are close knit. So I can't wait to spend time together during the holidays. This picture has to do with spending time with friends. You can say we're going to chill. We're going to hang out. We're going to get together. Sometimes instead of saying Thanksgiving in the US, we use the term Friendsgiving. <laughs> this is especially true if you can't go home to your family during the Thanksgiving holiday. You might hear people use this expression Friendsgiving. Sometimes we even say that close friends are the family you choose. So you can't choose who your family is, but you might say if you have some really close special friends, they are the family I chose. So they're just like your family, but you could choose them. <laughs> Here we have someone who is not going away on vacation. Instead, what is this guy doing? He is having a staycation. <laughs> this is a mix between two words, to stay and vacation, but it means He's not going to leave the house. He's not working. He's not going to school. He's just chilling on the couch with a book, some coffee. He's having a staycation. So you could say he's chilling at home. He's taking it easy or he's just doing nothing. <laughs> Here we have a lovely Christmas picture, a lovely winter picture. Uh, some expressions we use when we think about pictures like this is I'll be home for the holidays. It has this warm feeling inside that you've been far away from home, far away from your family, but during the holiday season, and maybe in your country, Christmas is not the big holiday. It might be another big holiday, but you might say, I can't wait to be home for the holidays. Um, sometimes we sing, uh, I'll be home for Christmas. It's a popular Christmas song. And this picture is exactly a winter wonderland. Where I live, it doesn't look like this. Maybe two days out of each winter, there's a snow like this, but it would certainly be nice to visit. <laughs> Let's talk about some traditions that happen on holidays. So in the US, a popular holiday is Halloween and we carve pumpkins. We also write letters to Santa at Christmas. Children love to write letters to Santa and tell him what they hope to get for Christmas. And usually the night before Christmas, so on Christmas Eve, children make cookies 
and set a glass of milk beside the chimney because that's where Santa comes down. <laughs> and in the morning, the cookies and the milk are mysteriously gone because Santa has come to eat them. <laughs> um, a very popular tradition for almost every holiday is that you cook special dishes and you eat them together. This looks like Thanksgiving because I see a wonderful turkey in the middle of the table, but I imagine whatever holidays are popular in your country, you cook special dishes. All right, let's go to the next category, which is shopping. This lady is window shopping. When she leaves home, she might tell her husband, hey, I'm just gonna look. I'm just going window shopping. I'm just gonna look. <laughs> now this guy, he looks like he's looking for something specific. So he could say, I'm looking for a specific vitamin. Excuse me, I'm looking for this vitamin. Could you help me find it? Or we can often use a fun verb to peruse the shelves. <laughs> this means maybe something's tricky to find, so he has to look on each shelf. He is perusing the shelves. And maybe really he's not looking for a specific vitamin or something specific. He could just say, I'm just looking, thanks. Maybe he's just browsing, just checking out the options. He could use that expression. I'm just looking, thanks. <laughs> now this person is in the dressing room. Sometimes these are called fitting rooms. So you might ask someone at a clothing store, um, excuse me, can I have a fitting room please? Or can I have a dressing room? Where are your dressing rooms? Where are your fitting rooms? She is trying something on. That's what you do in the store. It's quite common in the US to be able to try something on before you buy it. Here we have a uh, little kid shopper. <laughs> and there's a couple different terms that we can use to talk about that yellow thing. It could be a grocery cart. That's what I call it, a cart. But you could also call it a shopping cart, a buggy, or if you're carrying it, it's just a basket. I need to get a basket because I don't have to get many items. But it looks like this little kid is pushing around a shopping cart. <laughs> This man is carrying a pile of some large items. We use the term stocking up or stockpiling because he is getting a lot or a big quantity of things. This happened a lot during COVID and it also happens whenever there's uh, a big storm. People will go to the store and they will stockpile toilet paper, bread, those essential items, they will stockpile those items. Um, sometimes a negative word we use to talk about that is to stash those items. So during COVID, some people bought so many rolls of toilet paper, they had a stash of toilet paper, and it meant that other people didn't have enough. And this caused a crisis in some places. So maybe don't stockpile too many things, just enough. All right, let's go to our final category, which are movies and books. This picture represents action movies. <laughs> In action movies, there are often high-speed chases, explosions, fight scenes. Some popular action movies are Indiana Jones, Rocky movies, Mission Impossible movies, James Bond movies. Also, you might watch a thriller. This is a clip or a scene from the movie Memento. And I don't really enjoy many stressful movies, but I really enjoyed the movie Memento. I highly recommend it. These types of thriller movies are suspenseful. They're nail biters. You're biting your nails <laughs> because you want to know what's going to happen. Maybe they are hair raising. <gasps> oh, that movie was so hair raising. Every moment I thought something crazy was going to happen. It's very suspenseful. And there's often a cliffhanger at key moments. A cliffhanger means that you think something's going to happen and then boom, they cut to another scene. So you are left waiting. What's going to happen? <laughs> Uh, another type of this um, more, not stressful, but suspenseful movie is a fun term called whodunit. Now this means who did it, but we often combine this into one rather casual expression, whodunit. So we could say murder on the Orient Express is a whodunit. <laughs> so you want to find out 
who did the murder? Who did the bad thing? It's a who done it. Um, we can also call these murder mysteries. They're page turners. They have plot twists. I couldn't put it down because I just kept reading it. I couldn't put it down. I highly recommend reading this book, Murder on the Orient Express. This is the movie version. I think the book version by Agatha Christie is even better. <laughs> but some common who done it authors or classic authors, for example, are Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, he wrote the Sherlock Holmes series, and Agatha Christie, who wrote this. They are the classic whodunit authors. And finally, we have, talking about the word classic, classic movies. These are movies that are culturally significant, to use a term we talked about before. They are iconic, they're timeless, they are a must-see. So this is from Forrest Gump. It is a timeless movie. It is an iconic movie, and we could say it's a classic. Other classic movies are the Star Wars series, the Shawshank Redemption movie, Forrest Gump, the Godfather series. These are classic movies that you have to see in order to understand more about a culture and just to, to be a well-rounded movie watcher. <laughs> Here we have our final expression, which is a rom-com. This stands for romantic comedy, and these have lots of love and lots of laughs. <laughs> Usually the theme of these movies is that true love will win in the end. And if you are, you know, having a sad day, having a hard time, sometimes watching a rom-com can pick up your spirits. So how did you do? Did you enjoy this lesson learning important daily life vocabulary through pictures? I hope so. Don't forget to download the free PDF worksheet with all of this lesson's vocabulary, ideas, concepts, everything that you need to express yourself completely. You can click on the link in the description to download that free worksheet today. Well, thank you so much for learning English with me and I'll see you again next Friday for a new lesson here on my YouTube channel. Bye. But wait, do you want more? I recommend watching this video next. You will learn 250 more important vocabulary words with pictures, including which famous movie and book character is a goody two-shoes? Hmm, do you know this expression? Well, watch the video to find out, and I'll see you there.